Melzar, Daniel's dietitian. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel chapter 1, verse 8. Have you seen what we've been given to eat, Daniel? We can't eat this. Michelle's whispered outrage turned the heads of several children at nearby tables. I know, Michelle, Daniel replied. Eating this food will mean breaking Yahweh's law. Not to mention it's disgusting, piped in Hananiah. I think the wine is mixed with blood. It's a custom of theirs, I'm told. Azariah put his cup down quickly. Ew, yuck! Would you keep it down over there? hissed a child from another table. The prince of the eunuchs will punish you for disrespecting his house. His house? asked Daniel. I thought we were being held as one of King Nebuchadnezzar's wards. You are, explained the stranger. But the prince of the eunuchs is very possessive and expects us to treat this place as his and live according to his rules. He is not to be crossed. Don't worry about his head, added another child from the same table. Prince Ashpenaz will do him no harm. What do you mean? asked the first child. Do you see those cloaks? We were all stripped of our royal finery when we were captured and brought here to Babylon, but not him. He was allowed to keep his good clothing. But I too had my clothing exchanged. These are not mine. I was given them when I arrived from Judah, Daniel replied. Huh, so, it's even worse. You were actually given fine clothing from the prince of the eunuchs. Ashpenaz must have a soft heart for you, Judean. What's your name? I'm Daniel. And you? Where are you from? I was called Amet. My homeland is Oratu, near the mountain called Ararat. But now I am called Bella Amet. Ah, Bel is one worthy of praise, interjected Daniel. You speak Chaldean? Somewhat. During our long trek here, I began to learn the language. It may be why Ashpenaz is so kind to me. We had several halting conversations during the journey. I helped him with his Hebrew, and he corrected my Chaldean. It was God's will, I am sure. Who are your friends? Well, you might as well learn their Chaldean names, as they will be called by nothing else, I am sure. This is Hananiah, now called Shadrach. Mishael is called Meshach, and Azariah, who was given the name Abednego. And they called Daniel Belteshazzar, Shadrach added. They may change our names, but they cannot change who we are. And our laws forbid the drinking of blood. And some of this food is surely from unclean beasts, Abednego whispered. Then you will starve, commented Belel Ahmet, for this is all we are given. It may not be what you are used to, but it is excellent food, delicious. Beware, Daniel. What is delicious to the tongue can be dangerous to the soul. Well said, Meshach. So let's see what we can do about it. Daniel looked around the room. It seemed that the children were gathered in groups of four to eight, with one person looking after each group. Those in charge of the various groups were hovering around the outside of the room, chattering and joking. He could only understand bits and pieces of what they said, but it seemed there was some competition between various overseers. They were betting about which groups would bring the highest favor to the king. Their organization impressed Daniel, and it gave him an idea. Standing up at the table, he folded his hands and bowed his head. He was deliberately bringing attention to himself, and decided he should at the same time pray for guidance, wisdom, and favor while he waited for the reaction he knew was coming. And it was not long in coming, for the entire room drew quiet as table after table noticed Daniel standing still, head bowed in prayer. The overseers noticed the silence, and as each realized whose table the children belonged to, turned their heads toward one man leaning against the wall, asleep. He was short and very heavy. In the silence, his rumbled breathing, which could not quite be called a snore, was heard distinctly by everyone in the room. Awakened by the silence, Melzar, the overseer, shook his head and a sliver of spittle spun from his jowls. As chubby fingers rubbed his eyes, he became aware of several odd things. Everyone was quiet, everyone was looking at him, and there was a Hebrew child standing at a table praying. Then consciousness fully arrived, 
and Melzar realized it was one of his Hebrew children. What in the name of Bell the Wonders was going on? Pushing himself away from the wall, he waddled over to the table. What are you doing, he asked. Melzar spoke in Hebrew, as each overseer was required to speak the language of his charges. Praying, kind sir, replied Daniel. Praying for what? Praying for an audience with Ashpenaz, sir. The prince of the eunuchs? You're mad! Why, sir? I have a simple request for him is all. Daniel's innocent face infuriated Melzar. A simple request? You have no right to request anything. You are a captive slave. Oh, you may be without blemish, well-favored, and skillful in all wisdom. You may be cunning in knowledge and courtly manners. But you are a slave nevertheless. Now sit and eat. With that, Melzar turned and started to walk away. Please tell Ashpenaz thank you for this beautiful coat. Melzar jiggled to a stop. He paused, not just because of what Daniel said, but also because he spoke it in the language of the Chaldeans, his language. He slowly turned and squinted at Daniel suspiciously. How do you know our language? We have not yet begun our lessons. The prince of the eunuchs was kind enough to instruct me on our journey here. I helped him with his Hebrew. He is very good at languages. This cloak was a gift for helping him, though I believe I learned more than he. I owe a debt to him. Melzar visibly gulped. The prince had given this Hebrew slave a gift? The boy must be highly favored by the prince. This left Melzar in a quandary. Did he ignore the slave and possibly bring down the wrath of Ashpenaz? Or should he be seen to be weak and give in to this, this child? Daniel, seeing the problem Melzar was facing, offered a solution. Kind sir, my friends and I are not hungry at this time, and we would be honored to begin our lessons we are told would be offered here in your mighty kingdom. Melzar saw the opening and grabbed it. Well, I hope you have more of a taste of studies than you seem to have for your food. Come, the four of you, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Belteshazzar, follow me. With the air of a teacher, he led his charges out into the hallway. Stopping just outside the dining hall, he turned to the four teens and said, Our first lesson will be in courtly manners. I plan on taking you to meet Prince Ashbanaz, chief of the eunuchs. When you enter his room, keep your eyes on the floor and do not speak until spoken to. Keep your arms at your sides and your palms open toward the front. This will indicate to him, or your superiors, or anyone of royal lineage, that you come in peace, and have nothing with which to threaten. Do you understand? They all said yes, and they continued down the hallway. All along the passageway, the walls were covered with scenes of Babylonian life. Some of the mosaics and carvings were of agriculture or social settings, but most showed scenes of battles. Most likely, detailing victories won and lands conquered... Daniel imagined that there would be some day a scene of the Babylonian victory at Jerusalem. King Jehoiakim will be kneeling before Nebuchadnezzar, begging for his life. At least the temple was spared. Though many artifacts were taken, King Solomon's beautiful edifice still rose high on Mount Moriah, shining brilliantly in the morning sun. Nebuchadnezzar put young Zedekiah on the throne, probably thinking Zedekiah would do whatever Nebuchadnezzar would say. But... Daniel knew Zedekiah well. He was only a few years older than Daniel, and though they were not friends, their families ran in the same social circles. Daniel knew of the proud and foolhardy spirit within Zedekiah. Daniel feared for the future of Judah, Jerusalem, and the temple. Melzar's command to stop brought Daniel's mind back to the present. Wait here. I will see if Ashpenaz will see you. Melzar entered the chamber. Ashpenaz was sitting at his desk, writing. "'What is it?' he asked. "'Pardon the interruption, sir, but there is a Hebrew child here who wishes to speak to you. "'I know you are very busy, but he was insistent, "'and I felt that this child may be of a somewhat serious nature. "'I felt in my bones that you may find him interesting. "'I am no prophet, of course, but often I will be overcome with these feelings and sensations.' And I believe it may be the will of the gods that the two of you meet. If you do not find him of interest, I understand, 
But I cannot deny what my spirit tells me. Does this Hebrew child have a name? Yes, my prince. In the Hebrew tongue, he is called Daniel. But I am told he is now to be called Belteshazzar. Why, yes, my prince. How did you know? I gave him that name myself. Ah, so you met the boy. We exchanged language lessons on the return from his homeland. I found him most interesting. So, my spirit was correct, and I was right to bring him here? Yes, let him in. Immediately. Melzar smiled as he returned to the hallway. It never hurt to be seen as humble and wise. As he ushered the four boys towards Ashbanaz, he kept a sharp look to their posture. Heads down, palms forward. Excellent. Ashbanaz stepped up to Daniel and lifted his chin. Welcome to my home, Belteshazzar. I trust you and your friends are being treated well. The firm look the prince gave Melzar sent a shiver down his spine. Please, say yes, please, 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 he prayed silently. Daniel answered, with great respect and care, sir, we have no complaints of our lodging or our caretakers. Your staff is well-trained and honorable. Melzar let out the breath he had been holding. As discreetly as possible, he wiped away the beads of sweat that had appeared on his brow. Yet you ask to see me. What is it you need? As you know, sir, we are of the Hebrew faith, and as such are required to adhere to certain commandments from our God, Daniel explained. Within our laws, there are things we are told that we cannot eat. To eat them would be to desecrate ourselves before him. And even though the food we have been given is rich and I am sure is wonderful to taste, we cannot eat it. Ashpenaz looked carefully at Daniel. Returning to his seat, he spent several minutes gazing at the four boys as they stood, heads bowed. He leaned forward and spoke, Your God means nothing to us here. Our gods have defeated the gods of Assyria, Egypt, and many other lands. The God of the Hebrews did not stop our march into your city. Why would you continue to serve a God that forsake you? Daniel replied, He did not forsake us. We forsook him. Altars were built and groves were grown to appease other gods, gods that did not bring us to the promised land of our father Abraham. It was Abraham who first heard the voice of the one true God and left his home and his city, Ur. Ur? The prince looked up. Of the Chaldeans? Yes, sir. It seems, then, that we have ancestors in common. Yes, sir. And as our kings and leaders failed to follow the commandments of our God, he has allowed you to take us from the land given to Abraham and return us to the place of Abraham's beginning. Intriguing. But that leaves me with a bit of a problem. If I am to change your diet to suit your needs, then I am putting myself in danger. My duty is to my king, not your god. If you are not healthy and presentable for King Nebuchadnezzar, then neither your god nor my gods will spare me from his wrath. Daniel turned to Melzar and spoke, Prove us, I beseech you, for ten days, and give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our continents be looked upon and compare it with the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as you see and judge, deal with us, your servants. Melzar was frozen. Why is he asking me? Both the prince and Daniel were staring at him, waiting for his answer. Why do I have to decide? He screamed inside his head. Why is the prince letting me decide? Of course... If it doesn't work, then I will be the one punished, not him. Great. So do I risk it or not? What would Ashpenaz do? All right, Belteshazzar, Melzar decided. We'll try it for your way for ten days. If you don't outshine the other children, then it will be on your head. And mine, Melzar added to himself. Ashpenaz's wry smile let Melzar know he had made the right decision. Daniel chapter 1 verse 15 And at the end of ten days 
their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and among them all was none found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And therefore stood they before the king, and in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm.